All right, we're going to get started. We're at 6 o'clock, so grab the seat. So really appreciate everybody joining us in person. We have about 40 people. This is one of the biggest forums we've done so far this year. So really happy that the town uh, promoted this in the county. Appreciate everybody coming out. Uh, for those that are in person or online, we are recording this. Um, so if you want to share this with a family member, a friend, a neighbor, somebody couldn't get to the forum uh, tonight, be sure to share that with them. We'll put it on YouTube by tomorrow. Um, this is a forum. It's not a presentation just by me talking to you, it's talking with you. I live in your community, I wanna share some experiences you all have had, uh, experiences I've had, and talk about uh, some different things in terms of hurricane preparedness. We've got about 10 people online, we expect 20 to show up. Uh, so those that are online, you can ask any questions or make comments in the online portion as well. So thank you very much for joining us. I always like to start off a show of hands, how many years we've lived here or how long we've lived here. So raise your hand if you've lived here more than 10 years. And I stay here in Eastern North Carolina. So for the virtual audience that can't see, less than 10%, 15% have lived here more than 10 years. So we have a lot of newer folks that have moved to our community. Uh, put your hands up if you lived here um, couple, four years ago now for Hurricane Florence. So more, maybe almost, half, but not quite half. So for those watching at home and in person, this is what we're talking about. We have a lot of new folks to the area each year. Those experienced folks that have lived here more than 10 years, share your knowledge, share what you've been through, share what you would do differently or do the same again to your new neighbors. Uh, this is a talk we have to do every year um, because we have new people moving to our area. And we've got a lot to learn about preparedness. Even though uh, a lot of you are experienced in the room, I think you're going to learn some uh, different things through this talk. We're going to focus on specific things, the impact of the storm, not the category, and water, water, water. That is what is killing people with regards to hurricanes, not wind. It is water. And we're going to emphasize that uh, as we head through tonight. And again, I'm going to kind of pick on some of you to share experiences um, as you can throughout. A little bit about our office. If you came in at the back table, there's some literature, including some raindrop magnets that has our local website and social media. Please grab those. If you don't see what you want in the back, you can grab more things up front. The one I recommend the most, we're kind of short on these, so try to take one per family is a hurricane guide. Uh, State of North Carolina just made an update to them this year. They're really, really good information. It's a lot of what I'm gonna cover tonight as well. So who are we? My name is Eric Hayden. I'm a meteorologist with the Weather Service in Newport. We cover this area. We have over 100 offices in the country. Wilmington to our south covers Pender County southward. Raleigh covers the central part of the state and so forth. So if you're in the yellow shaded area, all of Onslow County, you are covered by our local office in Newport. We do cover out into the ocean. So if you've been to the beach, you've been on a boat, uh, we do specialized forecasts for the marine waters and also the aviation community mm -hmm. as well. That's what our office looks like during Hurricane Florence, all hands on deck. We're 24 seven, no matter what. If you come to visit us this Saturday night, two in the morning, at least a few of us are there. When there's a storm like Florence, we live there. We have a reinforced building, we have a generator, we're up high. We have backup procedures in case something goes wrong, but we pretty much stay there no matter what. And we do rotating shifts, much like a lot of police, fire, and first responders. We can't be there all the time, so we rotate through days evenings and overnights. This website is very important information. I say that because it is your local weather service office. We fall under the Department of Commerce and NOAA. We're a federal agency. You've already paid for this information. Um, our joke or our little catchy phrase with that is, if it's the weather you love, it's weather.gov. And all kidding aside, there's no, there's no commercials, no ads. You've already paid for it. The downside to the website is it's information overload. So you're gonna have to bookmark, um, play around with it, save what you like. But again, this is a forecast from the men and women down the road from you. They live in your community. We're looking at all the weather model data that you get on your phone. Uh, the difference is we look at that and make um, you know, changes based on experience and history and adjustments based on the local area. So it's weather.com slash Moorhead City. Again, please grab a magnet, has all our good information. A lot of what I'm talking about tonight with preparedness or forecast is all on our website, and we've got the QR code there as well. On that website, one thing that you have access to are weather briefings. This is high-end weather. We're talking 
Florence, the ice storm from this last year, mm -hmm. severe weather. So if you go there today, you're not gonna see anything, but when a storm happens, we expect active weather. If you go to the bottom of the page, you will be able to access um, the weather briefings that we sent to the county in terms of information. So a lot of good stuff there. We really like social media. I mentioned that's on our magnets as well. We like social media because it's a way to wave our hands and say, hey, 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 pay attention to this. This is important. We have a lot of stuff thrown at us all the time, a lot of noise, right? On the left is a tweet we did the morning of Florence. I vividly remember getting calls from our community, should I come back? The storm is not as high a uh, category. The media, should we not worry about the storm anymore? What do we, of course we answer, no, 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 still a bad storm. We hop on the social media, I type that specifically to, you know, catastrophic flooding. We don't just float out terms. Uh, we mentioned we're with the federal government. I get paid the same today or a sunny 70 degree Sunday or Hurricane Florence. We get paid the same. So when we use strong language, we mean it. We don't use that uh, lightly. On the right is an example of uh, YouTube. We don't have a ton of stuff on YouTube, but videos like this will post to YouTube. Um, briefings, recorded briefings we give to our core partners, that's on YouTube. Is it 30 seconds and you can quickly see what's going on? No. Is it 10 minutes of exactly what we expect to happen in the area? Yes. Is it detailed information for Oslo County? Yes. And that's all on our social media. Easiest way to find it is just NWS for National Weather Service and then put Moorhead City. So that's kind of the homework of the class. Uh, remember our website, weather.gov. Um, really important information. And if you put slash uh, Moorhead City, you'll uh, find the local page. We show this graphic every hurricane talk. If I spoke to you in April or May or October, the time to prepare is now. This graphic shows the peak um, noted by the red or yellow in about September 10th for hurricanes and tropical storms. But we have a long season. Two years ago, we had tropical storm Arthur as early as May. So we really talk preparedness as early as May, even though the official season starts in June. It's not too late to prepare. A show of hands, how many have completed their kit and they've done everything they need? They are good to go for hurricane season. So Stacy's there. So I have my water, I have some canned goods. I've got three younger kids, 14, 11, and eight. So what we do every couple of years before things expire, they kind of eat through the kit. So we, we were lucky last year or two, and so we've eaten through our kit, but I need to restock. This is the time. It's not too late, but it's getting close. The peak is mid-September, and it really ramps up here the next couple of weeks. Pretty much every year, you don't need to look at a weather model. Things are going to pick up. We're going to have storms out in the ocean. You're all nodding your head. You don't have to be a meteorologist to know that. Some of our biggest storms have been, you know, mid-August through about early to mid-October. The storms like Dorian and Florence, Hermine, Tropical Storm, Matthew, Sandy. So traditionally, that's when we get the bad storms. Um, share this information. I still remember 2018, Florence doing a talk like this about this time of year. And a gentleman's asking me, and he was serious, hey, it looks like we're going to make it through hurricane season. It's not until the middle of September. And a lot of you know this, but new folks moving to the area, when they say, oh, back to school, the kids are in school, we don't have to worry about it. No, 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 no. It peaks in mid-September. It's a really, really long season. Um, so we've established it's a long time here, but you know, I'm new to the area. I wasn't here in Florence. Uh, I don't know Dorian. Um, I was here, but just, just saying. Do I really have to worry about storms? Yes. Eastern North Carolina is the most frequently impacted stretch of coastline in the United States. Again, Eastern North Carolina, where we are, including the Outer Banks, is the most impacted stretch of coastline in the United States. A lot of reasons we stick out. Um, you know, we have a long, long season. Uh, so if you're wondering, if you're new to the area, should I be paying attention to this? The answer is yes. So we don't have control over whether we're gonna get hit. We don't have control over how many storms we have. If you've already bought your home, you don't have much control over adjusting it. Maybe you can raise it, maybe you can do some things, but a lot of stuff is set. But you do have control over planning. So only a few of us raised our hands that our kit and our plan was complete. So we have control over that. The first step on our website or the FEMA website or uh, North Carolina, if you just Google hurricane kit, 
our hurricane plan, you can find it. But on our website, I made this page. If you just put slash hurricane prep, everything you need is there. Know your zone campaign for North Carolina. What evacuation zone am I in? What do I need for my kit? Where, what uh, supplies should I have? That's all on that website. And the first step before you even make a kit or decide to leave is how vulnerable are you? Do you live right by the water in a low-lying area? You're vulnerable to water. Uh, do you live in a mobile home? You're more vulnerable to high winds and tornadoes. Are you like me, three younger kids and a wife that you have to worry about and want them to leave earlier so you focus on work and you don't have to worry about that? Have an older cat. That is in the consideration when they're uh, staying in a hotel and evacuating. My parents of 37 years in Maryland had lived in the same house. That was plan A. They were Dorian and Florence. They went up to Maryland. Really didn't have to think about evacuation. Now my parents are in this county. They're in Swansboro. That's a different risk. Now I have another thing to consider. So your risk is not just weather related. Who lives in your home? Are you on oxygen? Do you need electricity, not just for the comfort of AC, but for medical reasons? You need to talk about this today. What is your risk level in your home? It's not just weather-wise, it's also your vulnerability in the household. When we're talking about kits, uh, three days a minimum, food, water, medicine, everything you would need to survive, really pushing people to at least a week, like we saw with Florence, um, a week on your own, in terms of food, water, and medicine is what we want to push for. And we're cognizant of the times. Uh, the last couple of years have been crazy. Uh, some folks are struggling. You don't have to go out this weekend and get everything. And this is why I like these forms. Chief Ray, Fire Chief in Beaufort, over just east of Moorhead City, he brought this comment up. I'm not smart enough to think of this. He said somebody in his community approached him and said, hey, I don't have the money to go out to the store and buy $300 worth of supplies. He said, that's OK. Buy a couple canned goods this weekend. Next week with your grocery list, get water. Next week, maybe some batteries or stock up on your medicine. So if you have somebody that just says, I can't do it either financially or they just can't wrap their head around doing it all, just break it into small pieces. Um, that will make it a little bit easier. And certainly don't forget about your pets. Last one is your evacuation plan. Where would you go if you were told you need to leave because of the evacuation order or you just want to leave because it's the right thing to do. Where would you go? So my plans changed. We still have relatives in South Carolina and Columbia and Greenville. Plan B is probably now plan A. Uh, the mountains of North Carolina, it's not in the path of the storm. Think about where you would go depending on the storm. It's nice to go to Raleigh or Charlotte, not so much if they're also gonna get 15 to 20 inches of rain. Just because they're not on the coast doesn't mean they won't be impacted. So you wanna go away north or south, wherever opposite is of the storm. And that's the thing to think about today. It's so that when the storm is here, you don't have to think, oh, I don't have my food and water, I'm not ready, or where would I go? Um, those are things to think about today so you can just you know, make your plan, make your decision, and go with it. So I've done a lot of talking. I like talking, which is a good thing. Um, but I want to hear from you. I'm going to repeat what you say because we have a virtual audience, so I'll say it in this mic. Anybody willing to share experiences with their preparation? I wish I would have done this in Florence. Um, for new people, um, you need to do this. Anybody, especially those that uh, have a lot of experience, willing to share anything about your experiences, things you would never do again, things you wish you knew, um, I'll, I'll be happy to, to, to hear from you. And if not, we will move on, but I'd like to hear from the audience of some brave soul. Yes. <laughs> Sure. We just bought a house in Maryland. And it's second row, it's not on the ocean, but second row is close enough. And if this, I understand the storm surge comes up, then we're stuck if we decide to stay. There's no getting off the island. So, can they tell you, or can they predict each, and let you know in advance whether or not the water's going to be so high that you are trapped? So, yeah, and Stacey, if you want to say more, I'll start them off. Um, so the question from the audience was, hey, I live in the second row house on top soil here. Um, and, you know, I potentially could get stuck. Will you know that information before when you're making your decision? The answer is yes with regards to inundation. Um, we're going to talk in a couple of minutes on storm surge. And when we get close to the storm, 
we release an inundation map. It's a worst case scenario. Uh, it's what the community or the county uses for making evacuations. And it will give estimates three, six, nine feet above uh, normally dry ground, how high the water will get. So you'll get some sort of idea how not only how high the water will be, and then the county, based on those decisions, will make different decisions on whether or not to leave. And we always stress if they're tell what they're telling you to do is what you should follow. It's based on our, our forecast. Well, and I would just add really quick. And just if you um uh, so since we have a virtual audience on uh, so Stacy's from Oslo County Emergency Management, and she's gonna speak. I'll just say to that that when the National Weather Service shares information with us, we work with your town, with the town of North Topsail Beach, and Pender County works with Surf City and Topsail Beach. So all of the municipalities are all going to be involved in sort of that decision making. Your municipality is who will give you instructions, but it's going to be based off of their inundation map. So they'll tell us that they're expecting, you know, three to six foot of storm surge. That should tell you right where that water is going to come in and around your house. And yes, you are right. Once the winds reach 45 miles an hour in Onslow County, we can't run EMS anymore. And we can't run any kind of buses to really assist with evacuation. So that's where we kind of have to shut down sort of our operational services in the field. So that the information should be what helps you make that decision <clears throat> point. Any anybody else? And again, we'll definitely have time for questions and more. Of it. Uh, and but any experiences or have cash? So the gentleman, so the gentleman up front, he didn't say he has all the cash. Um, he says you have to have cash. So another very good one. Uh, power's out. ATMs aren't working. So have things like extra cash on hand. Very very good point. Thank you. So in the back. Also make sure that the trucks are taken care of because. So a great point from the back. The lady said, make sure not only cash, but have your gas tanks full. Uh, we had you know very, very long lines. I can remember vividly in Florence continuing to top off to make sure we were we were full uh, for me getting back and forth to work. But you know, some gas stations not only long lines, but just without gas if they don't have generator and we lose power. I'll share yes. I'll share just one more thing that, that we got not not only from Florence, but it's something that our office has been preaching for years in sort of this evacuation and, and the preparedness planning is when you're looking at where you want to evacuate to, we always tell people pick three different cities you want to go to. Find you three different hotels in each city you want to go to and put that in your plan. Write down the location, their phone numbers, everything, so that when you're driving up the road evacuating, you can just flip through your book, all that information's right there. If you've got pets, you already know that these hotels are pet friendly. You've already vetted all of that information. It just helps reduce one of those little stressors of that evacuation that you're going to be going through with the traffic, with the travel, with everything else. So that's when we did hear from a lot of citizens that that was something in Florence they wish they had done beforehand was sort of had that list with them ahead of time. All right, so really appreciate those comments from the audience and that's what we're going to do throughout. We don't want you just to hear me on and on and on about pre preparedness. We want to hear those experiences, cash, full gas tank, three, three cities, three hotels. Those are all really, really good ideas. So uh, from the weather service, I'm sure you've seen a lot of forecasts online and social media, the storms you know, three weeks out, we're going to get this big storm and it doesn't happen or it happens. We really want you to focus on the official forecast, whether you get that from the weather channel or your local meteorologist or the weather service. Focus on the official forecast from the Hurricane Center. We're looking at all that information. Uh, Florence, the error for Florence, the track was five miles, five days out. Uh, we still have room to improve with, with regards to intensity and some other you know, thing, aspects of the storm. But as far as track forecasting, very, very accurate. We like to show you this graphic. I know we don't have a lot of people that were here uh, in 1999, but that was one of the benchmark storms, Hurricane Floyd. Back then, based on the average error, we would say that the center, three days out, would pass somewhere from Georgia up through Southeast Virginia. Again, we just, the technology just wasn't there. So when Miss Stacy would call from Onslow County, even though we were back in 99, uh, we would say somewhere, again, a huge area. With Dorian in 2019, that error decreased to around uh, Southeast North Carolina. So vast improvements on the track. The Hurricane Center forecast is not only the most accurate, but it's the most consistent. 
Um, these are backed, backed up by the facts. And I mentioned the consistent part because anybody can put a forecast online and show a model of the storm hitting us. Anybody can do that. But what good do, does that do to you when then that storm now is going to hit Florida or now it's going to hit Delaware? How can you make your three hotel plan? How can you fill up your gas tank if it's going to hit us? It's not going to hit us. It's curving out to sea. Now it's going to hit Wilmington. So we provide a very consistent forecast for you to make your decisions um, backed by science. The next couple graphics I'm going to go through kind of quick, uh, depending on your level of interest and in, um, knowing what's out there, you may be more or less interested. The big thing to take out of the next three slides um, are hurricanes.gov. That's the National Weather Service, um, the Hurricane Center page. So weather.gov is weather service forecast, hurricanes.gov are hurricanes. Uh, this is useful. I know Stacy and others look at this. I look at this every day. Uh, this is a tropical weather outlook four times a day. They color in on the map. Is there an area we have to watch? Low, medium, high. Could be well out in the ocean, two weeks from hitting us. Do we have to worry about it? Uh, that is on the Hurricane Center website. The one you're probably most familiar with is this forecast cone. Again, you've seen it on the news. I, I know you've seen this graphic. What you may not realize is it continues to get more narrow with each passing year. It's not based on storm size. It's not based on how slow or fast it's moving. It's based on the statistical error from our past five years. So statistically, we're getting better and better and better. Uh, the problem is with such a narrow cone, some people now think that I'm out of it, I don't have to worry about it. I'm in it, I need to worry about it. And that's not the case. The cone shows where the center of the storm is most likely to go. Number one, it could deviate slightly. Knock on wood, recently that hasn't happened. But more importantly, farther from the center of our impacts, hundreds of miles away, Florence hit near Wilmington where we are impacted, right? A storm is not a dot on the map. So if you're anywhere in the general vicinity of this cone, you should pay attention. So this is Florence, really anybody from the Panhandle, Florida, up through the uh, Delmarva Peninsula, should be paying attention at this point. It shouldn't be, I'm in it, I'll pay attention, I'm out of it, I don't need to worry about it. These next two are planning uh, earliest time of arrival. Uh, this is when we expect, uh, in a worst case scenario, the winds to really pick up to 39 miles per hour. I use this for um, when anybody asks me, when should I be done my evacuation? When should I be done boarding up my house or whatever you're going to do? In this example, Wednesday evening with uh, Florence. Uh, these are our briefings. They're on the Hurricane Center page. You don't really have to go looking for them, but it's just something I wanted you to be aware of. In addition to the earliest, like worst case, we give a most likely. Well, when's it actually going to hit? When, when are we actually going to have those strong winds? That's what the most likely is. And again, this is all over the place. On our website, the Hurricane Center website, those briefings I talk about, it's in those as well. Um, for uh, updated information. All right, now we get to my most favorite part of the talk. So, um, and I can see virtual hands if you put them up, but I want to see some in the audience. Raise your hand if you heard anybody, or you've said it, your spouse has said it, a neighbor has said it, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna leave unless it's a two. I'm not gonna leave unless it's a three or a four. We've heard that, right? We all have heard, I'm not gonna leave it. For those that haven't, a lot of people look at this number and that's how they base their decision on whether they're going to evacuate or stay, or um, take the storm serious or not take it serious. This is the Saffir Simpson scale. It is only related to wind. Again, this is only related to wind. It's to be respected when Florence was a four and I live in Cape Carteret, three miles from the ocean, was I worried? Yes. It's part of the puzzle and it's important, but it's only part of the puzzle. It doesn't say how much rain we're going to have. It doesn't say that it's going to sit over us for four days. It doesn't say that it's a large or small storm. Uh, it doesn't say if you're going to be hit on the right or left side. There's a lot of nuances with tropical cyclones, and those are not things you have to think about. You don't have to sit here and think like, oh, I've got to, I got to figure this out. We're going to be telling you these things. Just please do not just focus on the number. Um, that's probably the bit, biggest misnomer. People just focus on the number and they don't listen to the other stuff. Um, if we have a tropical storm, doesn't even have a number, and we get 20 inches of rain, it's going to be a problem. So just kind of remember that. 
To re-emphasize that, 2010 to 2019, we had a lot of just ones. I like to put big quotes around that. Just a one, Sandy. Just a one, Florence and Dorian. Um, Hermine was a bad in some parts of our area. Uh, Matthew, just a one. Pretty big deal, especially uh, just inland from, from our county. Uh, so it's really all about the impacts, and that's where we're trying to shift the focus. Focus on what could potentially happen with the storm, um, not just the number. So some statistics to back it up, from the 60s to 2012, most of our deaths were water-related. About half were storm surge. That's a rapid rise of water ahead of the storm, like you were talking about in the back. Uh, another third was rainwater. And if you squint and look really, really hard, less than 10% were wind-related. Tragic? Could a tree fall on a house or car? Yes. Is wind dangerous? Yes. But traditionally, through uh, 2012, most of our deaths were water-related. Recently, last couple of years, uh, hasn't changed much. Uh, the biggest change is storm surge is only about 3%. And to answer the gentleman in the back, uh, we were a pilot office, and now it's been uh, the norm. Uh, we do storm surge watches and warnings, and there's those maps. So people are pretty up on storm surge inundation and flooding. Where we need to uh, continue to message stronger is freshwater flooding. It's not water that comes up all of a sudden. It's driving in areas you shouldn't or around barricades or going through water. We'll talk about that in a second. So that's how we're going to end. Water, 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 rain, surge, and rip currents. And then we're going to finish off with the wind uh, at the bottom. So this is a map from Hurricane Florence. For those that were here, we don't want to see this map again. Um, this is the time that you don't want Oslo County to be the big winner. With the Powerball drawing a couple weeks ago, we wanted you know, to be the big winner. This is not the time you want to be the big winner. Oslo County, 20 to 30 inches of rain. And that little light white shade uh, near Swansboro is like 30 plus. So tremendous amount of rain. We have sandy soils. Uh, if you just move here, we, we can take a fair amount of rain. Nobody can take that amount of rain. So when you get that type of rainfall, those smaller creeks and streams or what was roads, they become creeks and streams and you have flash flooding and flooding. The other issue is um, even though some of our major rivers are farther inland, um, they flow down to the ocean. So we have river flooding in our county, but also uh, cutting off getting out of the county or trying to, to move through the county itself. Uh, and the problem with being down toward the coast, um, it takes a long time for that water to settle back down and uh, lower. So this could be not only days, but weeks in terms of roads being closed. What I want you to focus on with this is not crossing flooded roads. Um, that's what a road might look like. You got water across it. Um, you don't know how fast it is. It's about a foot and a half that can lift your car up. Um, but the problem is you don't know how strong the water is, but you also don't know if the road is still there or not. So one of our biggest issues here, especially in some of our rural areas, is the roads will be scoured out. And you see the water and you say, oh, I've got a four-wheel drive truck. I'm, I'm lifted up. I, I can get through that. No, no problem. It's not just the water and the velocity, which that alone can carry you away. Uh, but it's a lot of the roads can be washed out, and then it's really, really deep, uh, more than you know. So big campaign with that. Turn around, don't drown. 16 of our 17 deaths in the Carolinas with Florence were flood-related in vehicles. Again, preventable deaths. It's like not having a smoke detector. It's, it's just, it's very heartbreaking because it's preventable. Uh, wind and surge and some things that happen all of a sudden, it's, it's, it's still very unfortunate, but, but it is, you know, uh, tragic just, just the same, but even more tragic to me when it's a preventable death like flooding is. So we talked about flooding, either flash flooding or, or along the rivers. Storm surge is something else we can get here along our coast, not just Topsail, but also uh, Onslow Bay and uh, over towards Swansboro on the White Oak River. What the storm surge is, it's a rise of water ahead of the storm. And there's a lot of factors, how large the storm is, uh, how long it's been over the water. With Florence, it was a category four, real small and tight in a small wind field, but then it weakened wind-wise, but the wind field expanded. So instead of having really strong winds in a small area, now you had strong winds, not as strong, spread out over a large area. And that really hammered us with storm surge. What about the storm? You know, staying over the same area, you have multiple tide cycles. Um, and speaking of storm surge, we have some video from Topsail uh, after the storm. We did some surveying. That's on our YouTube channel as well. So you can see some of the 
uh, aftermath with uh, with regards to storm surge. But it's not just a coastal threat. It can also occur inland. Um, so people, not just at the coast, but we had eight to 11 feet of surge. If you've ever been up in New Bern, along the Noose River, but also the, the Pamlico Sound is nearby and it can funnel up. Uh, that's a picture of downtown New Bern and on Ocracoke, similar to us here, we can have a rapid, real quick rise of water uh, because of our proximity to the ocean. So this is a scenario where it comes up in minutes. Ocracoke, it was uh, uh, four to seven feet in about 15 minutes. Yes, sir. Does New River historically cause the end of the island? Yes, sir, it can. It can. On storm surge and also just the water flowing down in itself. So you can you can get surge issues. Um, surge is really determined on a lot of factors of where it hits, how strong it is. And that's where um, I mentioned our track forecasting is very accurate. But with planning purposes in terms of evacuation, we always put in a little wiggle room. We, we don't tell the county what to do, but those inundation maps have some wiggle room in it because a small jog to the left or right makes all the difference in the world. If a storm were to hit our county and it's going to hit Swansboro, uh, then the worst will be from Swansboro east toward Emerald Isle in terms of storm surge. But if it just makes a 15 or 20 minute jog down the coast to near Surf City or Steeds Ferry, in Jacksonville, Topsail, those areas are going to be, you know, under the, the, the highest risk for surge. So those little wobbles matter with surge. Um, so that's why we kind of give a worst case scenario because it's there's a lot of factors that even a five or ten mile difference is going to mean devastation for one community and not as much for the other. Good, good question. So we do uh, issue products. Um, the upper left are storm surge watches and warnings. You'll get these on your phone. Um, they will be on the news. Typically, these are out 36 to 48 hours. So you're getting pretty close to the storm itself, but still enough time to make those decisions to leave. Uh, and this is what the county uses on the lower right, our inundation maps. You can't zoom into your street, but you get, can get a pretty good idea that, hey, um, you know, these values are something I don't want to play around with. I remember surveying after Florence and we would ask people, why did you choose to leave or stay? We were just more curious, not judging their decision, but we're scientists. We want to get the forecast right, but we also want to convey the message to you correctly. Are we not strong enough with our language? Were we too complicated? And uh, multiple people said once they saw these values were six, eight feet, they're out of here. Uh, so that was good information for us to know, you know, we're not going to just make up values to, to get you out of here, but uh, that the magnitude is definitely important. So we talked about flooding and surge. Rip currents is another factor. And this is well before, well after, or well away from the storm. So before or after the storm, you can have swell days in advance. So if you paid the big bucks to be in the beach house for a week, you got your whole week, and the storm's not going to hit until later in the week, and it's sunny and it's 85, you're probably going to go down to the beach. But what you might not be aware of is those powerful swells can cause rip currents. We had more deaths on our North Carolina um, coastline with Hurricane Lorenzo than Dorian. Does anybody remember Lorenzo? No. It was one of the northernmost Category 5 storms, 2,000 miles out to sea, October 2019, beautiful stretch of weather. We lost four people at our beaches from rip currents. So we put this information in our uh, briefings. Uh, people might say, you know, why are you talking rip currents, you know, um, during a storm? Again, it's it's before the storm gets here, after, or occasionally you'll see a graphic from us. It's September. We're not going to get any storm. This is storm 2,000 miles out to sea. This is why. So this is the information we want you to share with new folks in the community. Rip currents don't pull you under. They pull you out. There are natural breaks in the sandbar where the water rushes out, especially at low tide. Uh, direct them to swim left or right. Direct them to swim parallel. Um, you know, you don't need to go in after them. If you just direct them where to go, once you're out of the current itself, it's very easy to come back in. Um, my kids, I mentioned, uh, I've got three young ones. They do know how to swim, but they always go out with uh, a boogie board. It's not a life jacket. But think about all the times in your life where you know you knew the right thing to do, but you panicked. So once you can't stand anymore and you're being sucked out quick and your mom and dad are saying, get closer, you forget that you know how to swim. You forget that Mr. Eric says swim or left or right. With that boogie board, you just sit on it a second, take a deep breath and say, wait, 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 what am I supposed to do? Left or right. 
That's the kind of information we need to tell people that are coming down from Ohio or New Jersey for the one week a year for their vacation, or you've just moved here. They don't know this information like we do, uh, so please share that with them. A couple more slides, and we're going to turn it over to you for a little Q&A and form. Uh, this is Bogue Inlet Pier. This is just up the road from us. Uh, this is Hurricane Dorian. Tornadoes can occur with any system, not just hurricanes, tropical depression or cyclone. And the reason why I point this out is um, at this point of the talk, I said I'm throwing a lot at you, but break it into parts. If you decide to stay, it's a tropical storm or you're in a um, low risk area, that's your decision. Have multiple ways to get warnings because a, a tornado can spin up quickly and you're not going to be out there grocery shopping. You're going to be in your home, but you want that alert to get in the lowest part of your home, away from windows and protect yourself. Uh, these were some of the first outer bands with Dorian, almost 24 hours in advance. So when you hear about the center making landfall at whatever time, um, go back to those graphics where we say the winds are going to pick up at this time. That's what you fo should focus on because the hurricane's not a dot on the map. It doesn't get here at 6. It leaves at 8 p.m. It's a big ball of destruction, it could be, of rain and wind, potential rip currents and tornadoes. So if you choose to leave, leave before the uh, the rain and wind get here so you don't have to deal with this. To emphasize the point that tornadoes can occur well away from the storm itself, the arrow marks where um, Florence hit down on Rexville Beach. Multiple days later, they had tornadoes up in Richmond. Uh, in Richmond. Uh, so again, when you choose to evacuate your three locations, kind of keep in mind where the storm's gonna go after it hits the coast. And when you're at your destination, Pay attention to the weather. You might not be dealing with surge, uh, but you still might have heavy rain. You still might have tornadoes. Uh, if you choose to go to the mountains, uh, they're at a high risk for flooding because of the topography. So the last two slides emphasize the wind threat. Uh, wind is to be respected. Um, again, it can certainly do damage to your property. Um, but does anybody remember Hurricane Arthur for those that have been here for a while in 2014? Oh, a couple of people. Um, category two storm, it hit by Cape Lookout. Most of the issues were east of us toward the Outer Banks. Small storm, quick moving, uh, but it was a category two. Does anybody remember Irene 2011? I see more people saying yes. Are you sure? Because Irene was just a one and Arthur was a two, but you remember Irene more. Well, it could be because it was a large storm, slow moving, and it really got us. I know some parts of Swansboro had worse issues with this storm in Florence, it just depended on where you live. So re-emphasizing to focus on all the impacts. Don't, don't just pay attention to the one um, and say, oh, I'm not gonna worry about it because it's, it's not a three or four. Uh, so Irene was a big deal around our area. Um, before Florence, it was um, one of the worst storms for some, some locations uh, in Eastern North Carolina. 12 to 15 inches of rain um, and storm surge and things like that. So as we wrap up, one of the most popular questions I get in the beginning of the year or throughout the year is, what's the hurricane outlook for this year? How many storms are we going to get? The men and women uh, at the Hurricane Center and the Climate Prediction Center are, do a good job. It's predicted to be above average this year. The percentage has gone down a little bit, which is good, but still expected to be above normal year. We spent about 30 seconds on the slide because it doesn't matter. Not that the forecast is not accurate, not that that's not interesting, and not that it doesn't mean we do have more chances. If you have more storms in the ocean, yeah, you got more chances to be hit. Putting that all to the side doesn't matter. If we get hit, it only takes one storm to make a difference. It's not a cliche. We could have the wimpiest, weakest, smallest on record season in the history of hurricanes. But if we get that one big storm where we hit, it's a big deal. So we really try to get people away from this. It's interesting. Uh, but focus on things that they tangibly have control over. And that's this, uh, sharing this information, working on your hurricane kit, myself included, a lot of us, you know, I know we're getting into August, we haven't had storms. If you wait until that storm gets, you know, just out in the ocean, not even impacting us, water supplies lower, uh, things at the store lower. We've all dealt with the uh, supply issues the last two years. It's at the store now, you should get it. You wait until you get closer, it is going to be out. Um, assess your risk, focus on all the impacts, don't make your decisions based on category. And the last point is a very important one, don't forget about after the storm. We do all this preparation, 
and planning to leave and planning to um, you know, evacuate or a hurricane kit, all things we should do. Don't lose it at the end. Don't come back in a rush and go around a barricade that you shouldn't do. Uh, be careful being out in that water. You don't know what is in that water. We've had people in our community that have had infections and issues uh, because they're in water after a storm. If you have a generator, it's great. Make sure you know how to use it, not to use it in a closed space like a garage. Um, if you have a ladder and you're handy and you like to fix your roof or uh, clear debris away, that's great. Do it safely. We've, we've had injuries um, and deaths um, in some parts of the Carolinas, people falling off the ladders, being electrocuted, those things after. Uh, so don't, don't forget about the end uh, once that storm passes. So at this time, um, that's my email um, up on the screen. Uh, for those in the virtual audience, if you have a question, please ask it. Um, I'm going to share some more. Ms. Stacy from the county is here as well. So if you have any questions on where, where would I go to shelter in the county, um, there's a pretty neat system this county has among others. If you don't, if you haven't signed up for it, it's like one of the first things I want to get my parents signed up for. There's an alerting system you can sign up for in the county. That's not just weather alerts, but hazards and uh, other issues in the county. We can talk about that. Um, and just any any experiences you have for those that have been here for a long time is did you learn something new uh, during the talk um, those that were you know haven't been here for a while um, curious your experience this is a fourth year we've done this and we we change based on feedback so if you have any feedback for us um, we, we'd love to hear so this time it's your time we're done to talk uh, Stacy is here from the county I'm here from the weather service ask away if you need to dip out because it's uh, late, uh, that's no problem. This is being recorded and we'll put this up on YouTube. We'll share it with the town uh, and we should have it up by tomorrow. Definitely grab a guide and a magnet on the way out. But now it's your turn. Yes, ma'am. Where do we shelter for tomorrow? And then just make sure, yeah. So we actually just had a change in our shelters here for the southern part of the county. The new shelter is going to be Coastal Elementary, which is off of, off of Folkestone Road. The reason we moved there was when the school system built that building, one whole section of the building is rated to 150 mile an hour winds and it's fully generated. So we now have two schools that meet those parameters. So those we're, we're super happy about that, that we now have some really, really well rated uh, shelters that are fully generated. So that includes the kitchen, <laughs> which is important. <laughs> yes. Right. I've heard pros and cons of both. Okay. And what I will tell you what I tell everybody. Find you a good contractor and work with them. Okay. They they can answer the structural um, aspects of your house much better than I can because I'm just not I'm not an engineer. It's also good to have your have work with them to find out what the wind rating of your house is because that should be part of your decision making. Okay. The second question is where oh, are we getting the generator? Mm -hmm. Propane. Mm -hmm. Propane. So we know from the propane office we have to leave. Yes. Do the tanks have to be secured in away so they don't just rip around? Okay, so the, the question is if you have a, a propane generator or propane attached to your house, should it be secured? You are correct, and yes, please turn it off before you leave. But yes, you want to secure anything down to the ground like that because if we do get storm surge or we do get any flooding, it can lift those things up and then they essentially become projectiles as they're moving through and can cause more damage. Yeah, you will work with your propane company, yes, to, to help secure those down and, and the correct way for the propane. Yes, yes. <laughs> So her first, uh, the first question was about what was plywood or storm shutters better, and that's where I said to work with a contractor, someone who knows the structural engineering of your home as to what's better. Okay. Yes, I'll come back to you. You're about putting your electricity restored, mm -hmm. but does the oven shut down prior to the storm? The water sewage into the utilities. They shut it down. So I'm going to actually ask your town manager to speak a little bit to that. The answer to that, I think, is yes, no, and maybe. I think it's very storm dependent 
as to what may or may not get shut off, but you may you may know a little better. If scary storm dependent, they generally know we do not shut off the utilities before a storm. Um, I would just um, just reiterate what Stacy said and the gentleman from the National Weather Service. Please, if you have not signed up, sign up for the code red notifications. You can um, access that on our website and sign up. It's a very important first step with having your plan in place. Sign up for code red. Um, and, and just to add on for, as far as preparation is from the town, the town of North Popsville Beach goes, staff has been planning for the last several months to prepare for hurricane season. We have contracts in place. The board has approved uh, debris management monitoring and uh, pickup services for contractors to be staged at different locations to be able to come on and push onto the island to be able to uh, reopen as fast as possible. We're initiating agreements with NCDOT. Uh, so these are things that the town has been working on for the past several months to get ready for um, the event that we hope never happens, but we will be ready. Yes, you had a question. Um, I have two questions actually. First one is, is there a mandatory evacuation? And if there is mandatory evacuation, are homes safe from robbery or, you know, besides the storm, what about people's you know, other people so to repeat the question for the online audience, it was, um, are the evacuations mandatory or voluntary and what are the protections on the beach for your homes? And the answer is yes, they would be mandatory. When we ask you to leave, we expect everyone to leave. Um, at that point in time, staff would be uh, dispatched to um, our EOC center, which would be at the Coastal Elementary School that Stacy mentioned okay. earlier, and we would be ready to go on, push back onto the island immediately after the storm, and then alert people is when it would be safe to return. Is there some kind of, uh, so we moved here last year as well, and to re-enter the island, like to get onto the island, do you need, is there some kind of- uh, Re-entry pass? Yeah. Yes, the town does have re-entry passes for uh, residents, so uh, we can help you and assist you with um, getting those in advance as well. On on the website? I uh, yes, the passes are on our website, but you can come into the office and get the applications as well. And and there's some questions. Why don't we have I'm on the North Hotel and there's never a uh, flag notification at all. Even for uh, tides and rip currents. Right, or even yeah. We, we don't deploy a flag system. Um, we don't um, we don't have lifeguards. We don't deploy flag systems because it, um, unfortunately it, you can't always be out there to man and make sure nobody's removed the flag um, or if the flag has uh, blown away or you know to be able to properly maintain it. Yeah, and they do have flags. So just real quick, I did want to speak about with the evacuation orders that you brought up. You'll hear different evacuation orders. So the county will issue an evacuation order that might be slightly different than what North Topsail does. You all are an island. You've got one way on, one way off for the most part, unless you drive all the way down to Surf City. So the town, the municipality issues their own orders. The county may do a voluntary evacuation order. When we speak to evacuation orders or states of emergency, we're covering the unincorporated areas of the county. So when you cross that bridge and you go over into Surf or Sneeds Ferry, that's who we're talking to. We're talking to the nine miles and the, the Huberts. You always listen to your lowest form of government. For you all, it's your municipality. They're going to be the ones giving you directions on curfews, on states of emergencies, on evacuations. You want to listen to what they say. Ours may be a little different because we don't have the same hazard in Steve's Ferry that you have here on the beach. So we, we ran into some of that with Florence in that the county did a mandatory evacuation and one of the municipalities did a voluntary evacuation and it caused a little bit of confusion. So we've really spent the last four years trying to, to clear up that you've got to listen to your, your municipality, whoever your lowest form of government is that you answer to, that's who you want to listen to. 
Yes. Do, do we have some kind of the communication plan? I think is where I'm going with this. Uh, is there, other than the website, what are the forms of communication and, and the hierarchy of that? I know during Florence, the website was off. Cell phones were down because the substance, this, you know, the towers were not powered. And, and so you couldn't communicate on the internet or by phone. I think they were using CB radios um, and ham to, to get word out. But then, of course, there's no way for the town to get the message out to the residents when you could come back. So, how is that? Should, how is that? Are you going to tackle that? Is there a radio station? Is there, is there a plan to where the information will be? That we can find it in the event of North Hawks will be working very closely with Onslow County, will actually be at the same location for the most mm -hmm. part. So we will have a lot of additional resources. Um, I don't know that um y'all were <clears throat> in the same location last time. I was not here for Florence. Um, no, we were at for that Dixon Middle last time. So this time it'll be at Coastal Elementary. Um so there's multiple means of communication and, and just for the online audience, the question was about the communications between the citizens and the, the community. So the town of North Tulsa Beach and Onslow County. So there's going to be multiple forms. We're going to hit every avenue and media that we can. So radio, TV, social media, um, you get the code red alerts. And I know just like you said, with Verizon was out for a lot of the county. For cell phones, so you just didn't have cell phones or the weather radios. Information will go out over that way. Yes, we have ham radio. We have ham radio operators in every single shelter in the county, and we also have a ham radio operator at BOC. So we can always exercise pushing information out that way. Um, unfortunately, there's times where we just lose all those avenues and getting that information, it's just going to be word of mouth at that point. So uh, yes. It's about the ham radio. I have the walkie talkie that's a five mile. Mm -hmm. Would there be, you know, put it on number one and know that I might connect with somebody? So that is a radio question that is beyond my. Uh, <laughs> we would just go and say. I don't know the ham radio and no, the walkie don't. talkies talk. They don't. But yeah. I'm saying other people that have the ham radios, if we just say, or the walkie talkie, I mean, mm -hmm. sorry. Say get on number one, just as a general rule, and know it's it's only a five mile, but we could connect. I mean, I'm connecting with the group out in Jacksonville, but that's what we're planning. But I thought if the town did something like that, they'd say if you happen to have it, because I don't have it for emergency, I have it for a car bus, but I know to get on and put on number one, and then we would know so we could communicate. Okay. okay. Good idea. Back in the back, yes. This is kind of like after the storm question. Mm -hmm. uh, the, when the storm passes and you know they reopen, how soon do the police come back? If we're evacuated, say to the mountains, and we don't come back on purpose for three or four days until things settle down, are the police going to be back here the next day? Yes, as soon as the wind start down. Yeah, it, it, as long as it's daylight and as soon as the winds die down, usually is when you'll see emergency services, which includes your law enforcement, will be right back over on the island. Yes. Yeah, I kind of have a before the storm question for everyone. You, you listen, especially on the Weather Channel, they talk about the European models and the American models, and, and lots of times there's great variation in the models. Why is that? Why are they using the same data and historical information? Why, why are they sometimes diverse? So to talk about the storm itself, um, it's to have different aspects of the storm to talk about. So the question from the audience was um, sometimes when you watch this weather channel or other things on TV, they talk about the European model or the American model or the spaghetti models, which I, I didn't mention that plain spaghetti in the graphic that we showed earlier. I had a good seafood dinner before tonight, so that's why I didn't mention that. Um, but the reason why they or others show the other models is to talk about the storm, but we're all looking at the same thing. Um, at the Weather Service and the Hurricane Center, we take all of that and we do what's called a consensus forecast. Instead of uh, picking one model and favoring it, we kind of blend it together and we'll use our experience and lean toward which one might be doing better so that we prevent what's called the windshield wiper effect. And I kind of talked about that. It's here, it's there, it's back and forth. 
Uh, so we take them all and we uh, use a consensus forecast in the weather service. So um, TV wise, they're just talking about it. Uh, they show the official forecast, but they're showing you other scenarios because they're filling the time. I know this because I was on TV for five years before the weather service, and they're not doing a disservice. They're just they need to fill the time, so they're showing you different aspects of the storm. But really pay attention to the one they show from the Hurricane Center or online. Uh, it tends to be not only the most accurate and consistent. And I'm not just saying that because I'm with the Weather Service. We we crunch the numbers and we show show that. So pay attention to the official sources. Come back to something that the state said and Manny Reserve commented on. That's the mandatory evacuation district. Safety said when wind is up to 45 miles an hour, EMS doesn't respond. Well, public service doesn't respond. It wind is up next to that bridge is closed. Sir, yeah. would you mind popping up? So um, I know it feels awkward for the in-person group, but we've got about 10 online. And then we're going to share this recording afterwards. So just introduce who you are, and then you can talk to the audience if that's the uh, so Mike Benson, one of the elected officials here in North Dakota Beach. I'm emphasizing the fact that when it is a mandatory evacuation, that you must leave the island. The bridge, when the wind gets up to hurricane velocity, as Stacy said earlier, EMS doesn't run. Please don't run. Highly permitted. You need to be off the island. When the mandatory evacuation kicks in, that's that's the point that I was trying to make. Thank you. Mike Bob. Mm -hmm. The bridge. Mm -hmm. bridge. Okay, shut yeah. the bridge down. Yeah, the, the bridge will be yeah. shut down, uh, and uh, no one will be allowed back on the island until the uh, storm has passed and it's deemed safe to return to the island. That was the question you were. Asking, many people are asking when can we come back? Well, when public safety determines that it's safe in cooperation with the town manager and with the other two towns on the island because Surf City has a bridge, so we have to coordinate with the other two towns so that the island opens at the same time. Yes. I have a question about the storm surge. So we're right on the other side in King Terry. As the crow flies on here, it's a couple hours from the ocean. So, but we're on the couple of miles from here, on the um, other side of the intercoastal waterway. So, how would the storm surge impact that part of the land? Or would it? Yes, it, it would. So, the question from the audience was uh, she lives in the Sea Sierra area. Um, you're on the intercoastal side, I think she said. Yes. Uh, so the question was about a uh, storm surge. How would that area be impacted and would it? The answer is yes. So um, especially low-lying areas near bodies of water, as that water gets pushed in, it, it can rise not just ocean front, but up smaller creeks and streams, and that includes the intercoastal waterway as well. Um, and it really depends on the track um, and, and everything, because you can also have issues on the back end as the storm's leaving, the water can pile up on the backside. So it just depends on how the wind's blowing, what the tide is, or you're at higher or low tide, uh, a lot of factors. But the answer is definitely uh, yes. Uh, and we say above normally dry ground, we kind of changed that a couple of years ago. It was mean low water and high water. What it means is if you are living in a low lying area near any body of water and the ground that's near that body of water, the creek, stream, the intercoastal, that's usually dry during high or low tide, um, that will be three, six, whatever feet above that area is what we predict for inundation. So, yeah, you'll see it on the map, um, the inundation maps. Uh, elevation is a big role. I, I forgot to mention on this, um, if you Google NC flood maps, there's really good inundation mapping uh, through our state. They do a really, really good job. And you can see uh, not, not just your elevation, but at what levels uh, areas get inundated. Not, it's not perfect, but it's based on elevation and some other factors. And you'll see the trouble spots. You'll say, oh yeah, that area, usually does get water and you'll start to identify areas that are vulnerable based on your experience. Um, but knowing your elevation is important. Uh, it's part of the, the puzzle, knowing how vulnerable you are. Awesome question. Uh, usually the easiest way is just to Google NC flood maps, but it's called Feynman, F-I-N-M-A-N. Um, I think it's flooded a nation, something, something, and mapping. <laughs> but, uh, 
Yeah. And we, you can come up at the end and um, we can look at it at different times. Usually I Google NC flood maps, very, very good information. The other one on the website, and it's on the county as well, know your zone. So the county's uh, broken into different zones. That's another tip for, hey, I'm in a vulnerable area or not. If you're in, is the A's most vulnerable? A. Yeah. yeah. So A, the, the red zone, you know, you're going to be more likely in a low lying area or beachfront. Yes, sir. Yes. You, you asked earlier, um, I don't know, a few of the questions why people would not evacuate. And I'll tell you from past experience, um, most of our, if not all of our evacuation routes go through flood zones. So once you get out, if you're lucky enough to get out, then you can't get back for days or weeks. Um, back to the island, no fucking no solid wood these bridges. They were put there because it all washed out twice in one year. So if they wash out, I don't know the open, but you still can't get to where you need to go in all the things for pretty much wash out. So a lot of little factors. It is. Uh, the gentleman in the audience mentioned it's not easy in our area just to say leave, stay. There's a lot of factors, and one that keeps people here uh, is the, the knowledge that they have trouble getting back. Uh, with Florence, it could be days or weeks. Um, Highway 70 in Kinston is a perfect example that, you know, that could be for a long, long time. Uh, we always stress, you know, your life is more important, um, but it is your decision at the end. Um, but it's not easy getting back. It's definitely a challenge uh, to, to be aware of. Uh, there's ways around it, um, but if the bridge is out or the road is washed out or closed, you're not going that way. So good, good uh, information. Yes. Can you clarify something? So uh, last year for one of the hurricanes, the alert went out that the electric would be cut off on Wednesday at a certain time and the water would be cut off at a certain time as well. So is that no longer going to happen then? Or... That, was, that was cut off. That was cut off by the power company. Yeah. That was a decision they made. We don't have control over that. Right. Oh, no. Because you can't put down your shutters if you don't. Right. It wasn't cut off. No, no, I realize that, but just wondering with the comment that we wouldn't be. And the town was not cut off. The town was not cut off. The town's not cut off. I'm lost at it, too. Yeah. I'm worried about it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, if uh, power and water were on, would you reopen? Right? Yeah. 
will not be open. No, we will not. I know this is turning into a, a town process preparedness for the individual preparedness forum, but I have two more questions for the town. Does the town have a plan to to deal with traffic prior to the storm hitting? Is there a cutoff date? Do you supposed to put the cans in, or do you have contracts with the garbage service to pick up a can like on an off day because a storm is coming at such and such a advance notice? Once we knew that a, an event was coming our way, we would get with the contractors and the trash hauler would be one of those. Uh, we would make sure that town facilities were all buttoned up as far as, you know, we would have all dumpsters emptied, all trash receptacles, anything that was out as far as cans on the beach would be tucked away and secured so that they weren't blowing about and the trash wasn't blowing everywhere. Um, we would also communicate to the residents um, their plan at that point in time for picking up early because there's always a plan to pick up early from the contractors when an event is pending. One more, I'll follow up with that. Um, it was about 10 years ago, there, uh, I can't remember what store it was, it might have been large, but there was a policy in the town to push sand into the cutout for the dunes. Are for emergency vehicle access and actually fill those in prior to a storm hitting. And then a few years after that, we stopped doing that. And when we had Florence, that was actually one of the places where the storm had broke through the dunes. Got a couple of places on the island because those were not filled in. Has right. the town planning on taking the back of those in and taking three years? No. We, we would not be able to do that because of permitting issues with the state. Um, even when we come back on, when there's a push, of course, there's not a lot of vegetated debris, like some communities have to deal with. Most of our debris is going to be sand related and sand push. And there's all, um, we have to follow very closely to the permitting requirements. It has to be screened as a process. So we'll not be able to just push if there's uh, rocks or any type of aggregate in that sand, that would be problematic. As far as the, just the town's up, permitting. Just to close up a, a drive through of a, of a, a dune? No. Up up? A lot, a lot of this. Uh, they're already in the land 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 land. A lot of the state and federal um, regulations around the dunes and around the sand changed in the last 10 years. So that's probably where you saw that, that change in their ability to sort of pre close those beforehand. So that's unfortunately out of, I think, out of the town's hands and out of the county's hands. We would not want to do anything that jeopardizes our future permitting <laughs> for future nourishment projects. Well, it did have an impact for those of you who might not know. There's a few places that in part that those were not closed. Uh, many of the homes behind that in a pool, maybe a block wide, had 16 to 18 inches of sand. Has watched them through that where other places that the dunes have to take for the diverse. Thank you. Thank you. Thank sure. you. Sure. Any other questions? Yes. I just like to say one more thing when you're doing your hurricane stuff, don't forget about the outside. You know, like it's just a tropical storm. Everything you can do is some of the deck out or can get lost in even your garbage can. It's so easy just to take the rope, your hose, anything, and lash all your stuff down. One year we came back and we had five grills in our front yard. <laughs> so, we, no, we put them up all the time the rope. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a, a pretty good point to reiterate for the virtual audience. And the point from the back was to, you know, even if it's a tropical storm, any any wind related issue, it can be even severe thunderstorms, uh, to make sure to secure your objects outside uh, because they will become projectiles, trampolines, trash cans, grills, all that will be in your neighbor's yard uh, down the road and potentially damaging their uh, homes and also uh, injuries. So, uh, you know, not just the big storms, make sure you secure uh, the items outside. Question in the back? Yeah, I think I'll come back. Uh, and someone told me this, but I don't know if it was an official, but I believe it was one of the They said that when that might have been, we have those uh, wood chairs where I'm full. They said we're out there because we really have the word to secure them. They said they put them into the pool. Is that a good idea? 
They have to run them. Yeah, to run them. Really but if they float. They don't float for any. Okay, the ones that sink. sink that yeah, these are not wood. They're hmm, recycled. They're made out of recycled. Right, but I know what they. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> My only concern would be with if if we had enough storm surge that it could pull them up out of your pool, and now they're floating debris that could still cause damage. I bring, I've got patio furniture as well. I bring my patio furniture just inside my family room and set it. Um, I realize most of your all's houses are stilted, so you don't have a garage. Those are also an option for the people in the Seas Ferry and whatnot. But like I say, I, I pull mine, even when I lived in Wilmington, I would pull everything and just sit it in the dining room or the living room just until the winds pass. I, I do it with some of our really strong wind storms that we have come through. Um, the one we had a few weeks ago, my, my flag on my front porch apparently became a prick. Jack Holland found it three houses away. So it really, it doesn't even take a tropical storm or a hurricane to make something a projectile. So yeah, it, bring in, if you've got, like I had my flag just on the side of my house, bring those in and sit them on your dining room table. Just get everything like that loose in because it will go through people's windows. It will go through the side of their house with enough, enough wind behind them. And definitely if we have tornadoes, that, that all becomes projectiles. All right, I think that's it. I really appreciate it. Thank you all. This has been one of our most attended forums the whole um, year. And thanks to the town for having us in the county as well. Couldn't do it without you. We need those types of questions. Uh, do us a favor when we put this on YouTube or we come here next year and come back or share it with a friend um, because we need to do this each year because we continue to have new residents that move here, um, high military presence in our area um, that are turning over so they don't have this information uh, at their fingertips like you all do. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.